Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the PCI SIG webinar, PCI 5.0 Protocol and Electrical Compliance Testing Deep Dive. We'll get started here in just a moment. Hello everyone, thank you again for attending the PCIe 5.0 Protocol and Electrical Compliance D Testing Deep Dive Webinar. I want to take just a moment today to introduce you to today's presenters. Anthony Mickens is the Product Manager at Teledyne LaCroix with experience as a field application engineer focused on high-speed serial applications. Gordon Getty is a Technical Marketing Manager, Solutions Marketing at Teledyne LaCroix. He has 20 years experience in PCI and PCI Express testing and compliance programs. I'll go ahead and pass it over to Gordon to discuss today's agenda. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining the webinar today. Uh, we have two parts to the webinar. Uh, the first part uh, I'm going to cover is around PCI Express 5.0 protocol compliance testing. And we'll go through some of the, the overview of compliance testing in general and some of the new features in PC Express 5.0, along with form factors. I'll go into a little bit more detail in the link and transaction layer tests and the lane margining testing. Then I'll hand it over to Anthony and he'll cover part two, which is PC Express 5.0 electrical compliance testing. And in that, he'll cover uh, an overview of the electrical compliance part of the compliance program and uh, some test procedures in detail around transmitter, electrical link equalization, receiver link equalization, PLL bandwidth, and reference clock jitter testing. So as I mentioned, I'll cover first of all the PCI Express protocol compliance. There's many different groups of tests within the compliance program, and these are all required to, to basically become uh, uh, and included on the integrators list for, for compliance testing by the PCI SIG. This testing is all done at compliance workshops. Uh, and the part I'm going to talk about is the, the, the four at the top there, lane margining, which uses a, an exerciser tool to run. Uh, it can also run on a, a PC platform. The link layer tests and the transaction layer tests use an exerciser type tool. That may be, you may be familiar with the term PTC or protocol test card. It's really just an exerciser tool. Uh, and then I'll mention briefly the configuration space test. This is a software tool that runs on a PC. And then the section in blue at the bottom is where uh, I'll hand over to Anthony and he'll cover each of these parts in detail. So what is PC Express compliance? Compliance really means that a product meets the standards set forth by the PCI SIG in its PC Express test specifications. And the compliance program, which has been running for, for many, many years now, uh, is, is run by the, the PCI SIG. And this is where the interoperability and compliance tests happen. So it's important to note that it's not just the compliance test, it is also interoperability tests that are required for uh, members to get their products tested against other members' products and then ultimately listed on the integrators list. Um, so the compliance test allows for the product testing against each of the areas that we, we talked about in the previous slide. Uh, and each of these gives a pass or fail result. Now for the compliance part of the testing, uh, it must be, uh, it must pass all of these 100%. Uh, and for interoperability testing, it must be 80%. So you need to pass in four out of five systems basically that, are, that you test in. Um, it may depend on the number of systems at a particular workshop, <clears throat> how many you actually test with, but, but it must be at least 80% for interoperability testing. And then the ultimate goal is the integrators list. So the valuable benefit of the compliance program is to have your device listed on the PCI SIG integrators list. Uh, this basically lists uh, all products that have completed all the testing at the compliance workshops, uh, and it's only available to member companies. So it can't be used for marketing programs. It's not really a logo program. It's uh, just a list of all the devices that have gone through a workshop and, and tested successfully. So compliance testing is based around uh, test specifications. These are separate from the base specification, but they're also defined by the, the PCI SIG. 
And the serial enabling work group is the work group that's responsible for creating these test specifications. Uh, they're all available on the PCI SIG uh, website um, and for, for members. And preliminary FII uh, testing for PCI Express 5.0 started back in February 2021. So it was, you can see it was just over a year it took from the preliminary testing to the official testing, which started in April of, of 2022. Um, the 5.0 testing really is an evolution from the 4.0 testing, so same principles. Uh, but obviously, there's things like new fixtures are required to work at the higher data rates. And there's new exerciser tools available. Um, the same concept is used for, for the testing, uh, but new tools are required to work at PCI Express 5.0 data rates. And also, we made the lane margining test, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. As, as a mandatory test for PCI Express 5.0. It was an optional test for, for PCI Express 4.0. Important to note that the feature itself is not uh, optional. The feature is mandatory, but the test for PCI Express 4.0 was optional and the test for 5.0 is mandatory. So how are these groups uh, broken down? So really the, the PCI SIG compliance testing fits very well into the, the layered model. Um, so configuration space uh, testing is, it's not really, it's kind of above the transaction layer, but it's around the enumeration and configuration of, of devices. Um, and then we go through the transaction layer testing. I'll go through some examples of what that is. The data link layer testing, the link training testing, and the lane margining testing, which kind of happen at the physical layer, but in the logical subblock. So they're not really electrical tests. They're, they're really logical tests, but, but still in the physical layer. And then there's the electrical testing, which Anthony will cover later, which is only in the electrical sub-block of the, the physical layer. Uh, just a note that we used to do BIOS testing on systems. Um, this was discontinued after PCI Express 4.0. So the link and transaction layer testing and, uh, is, is only done on add-in cards or, or endpoints. Uh, it's also done on switches. Um, okay, next slide. So the configuration and link and transaction layer tests, um, those test suites are, are available. Um, the CV tool comes from the PCI SIG, so you would contact uh, the PCI SIG or the, or the website directly to get that tool. There's also the lane margining tests. Um, there's two different variants of that. One is if you are using the exerciser tool, it can be run on that. If the device requires a device driver for lane margining, which uh, there's a small percentage of devices do, uh, there's a software tool that can be run, um, and there's actually two variants of that available from the PCI SIG, one of them within the PCI CV application, and then there's another one that's available from PCI SIG. The system testing for uh, lane margining is done using the, the software tool. And the configuration tests, like I said, they, they started the preliminary version back in 2021, and the, the full version is, is all obviously been used since April 2022. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail here on the link and transaction layer test, uh, tests. So there's different groups within the link and transaction layer test specification. Long, a long time ago, we had uh, two separate test specifications for link layer and transaction layer, but we combined these into, into one. Um, and this consists of tests around the data link layer, uh, tests on the transaction layer. It also includes a number of tests that are around the equalization protocol. Uh, I'll cover this in more detail in a moment, but the, uh, this is really about how the protocol behaves during the equalization negotiation on the link. This is not to do with the electrical characteristics at this point. That's something that will be covered in the electrical testing, but it's important that the protocol works properly. There's also some other logical file layer tests, uh, specifically I call it here the reserve bits test. So that's where what happens in the training sequences or in the link training process when I set the reserve bits to one. Uh, this test came up historically from uh, way back in PCI Express 1.0, 2.0 days where setting the reserve bits to be uh, a one caused the link not to come up. So in theory, the other side should ignore those reserve bits. Um, it particularly happens when we add a new data rate bit, for example. So when the 5.0 data bit data rate bit was used in the training sequence, some of the 1.0 systems didn't like it. So we created a test to be able to catch those. And that's the general the idea about compliance testing is that we can catch these corner cases before they go out in the real world uh, and cause interoperability problems. I mentioned the lane margining test just a moment ago there. It's really a functional test. It's not a test about how, how much margin your device has. It's really, did you implement the lane margining 
capability in your device. And that's really what the test is designed to do, to make sure that if you change things electrically, that you will get uh, a different result. Uh, there's also a test for pre-coding, something that was added in the PC Express 5.0 spec. Um, and really, in these Lincoln transaction layer tests, uh, the they're testing error handling. So what happens in a corner case if this type of error happens? Does the whole thing crash and burn? Or does it handle it gracefully as, as it's defined in the specification? Uh, and the other thing that's tested, like I mentioned, for the lane margining test is that a capability is implemented. And if it is implemented, is it implemented properly? So these are all covered in the, the Lincoln transaction layer tests. So the link layer tests have principally been running since way back in PCI Express 1.0 days. Uh, the, they test things like the replay timer, the replay number. Uh, what happens if you have too many NACs? Does it uh, go to uh, recovery properly? What happens when you send a bad DLLP? Um, what happens when the replay counter is you know, overflows? Or what happens if you have a bad LCRC on a packet? Does it handle that properly? It also checks that when those conditions happen, depending on the, the way error reporting is enabled, is that uh, being reported properly? And I've included a list of some of the link layer tests. These tests principally have been there since 1.0. We still run them all the way through the Peace Express 5.0. They're, they're still valid. So an example here, the bad LCRC test. So this is a log file from, from running the test. So there's a, a little description there. The intent of the test is to verify that a receiver discards a TLP with a bad CRC by knacking it and report a bad TLP error associated with the port. So that's the statement from the test specification. <clears throat> and then the exerciser tool or the PTC tool will go through each of the steps to clear the errors, create the error case causing a bad LCRC to happen, and then read the error bits in the in the registers and check the messaging of, of errors. And at the end of that, if those cases are met, then the test will be passed. If they're not met, then the test will be considered a fail. So when we run all these tests, we save all the log files and those are all submitted to the, the PCI 6. So this is kind of the evidence that we, we run the test. And each, each test case is gonna have a, a log file generated with it. Uh, that's true of the, the CV test, the link and transaction layer test, the lane margining test. In some cases also, there will be a, a trace file. So from the, the analyzer part, so really when the exerciser runs, it has to capture a, a trace file to determine what was the behavior. So it creates the condition on the exerciser, then the trace is captured. And then in this case for the bad LCRC, you can see that uh, it's created an incorrect LCRC there. The packet is uh, knacked, that's correct behavior. Then the dot reports the error by sending the correctable error message. Uh, and then the replay happens since there was a knack on the first one uh, because it never reached the other end properly. So basically testing the data link layer mechanism for, for CRC checking. Um, the link and transaction layer test spec uh, also states that some of the tests they should be run at different uh, link speeds. Uh, it doesn't apply to all tests. Some of the tests are specifically for a particular data rate. Uh, and during the test and the test cases will choose the appropriate speed. So you'll sometimes see when you're running these tests that they actually run at all the different capable speeds of that particular device. Uh, we've seen cases where it's possible that a test runs just fine at the highest data rate and fails at five giga, giga transfer per second, for example. So that's why we go through these, these particular uh, tests with, with all the data rates. Up the pro protocol stack a little bit, uh, the transaction layer tests. Uh, uh, tests are like poison TLP, what happens if we have a wrong TLP sequence number or a nullified TLP. Also what happens when we have uh, an unsupported request to a, a transaction, is that handled properly? Um, there's a test for bad ECRC. We actually just made that test as an informational test only. Um, uh, but it's still a test that is run as part of the compliance suite. So any informational tests are, are run just to, as a warning, if it fails, then you may want to check it out, but it's not counted towards the integrators list inclusion. Um, and then, like I mentioned, poison TLP, wrong TLP sequence number, and nullified TLP are other examples of, of transaction layer. Then I have an example here of what the, the log file for the poison TLP would look like. And you can see within some of the test cases, there's multiple, uh, multiple subtests. So in this case, the intent of the test is to verify the DUT will check the EP bit in a received TLP containing a data payload that targets the DUT. And if the bit is set, it logs a received poison TLP received error associated with that port. Uh, but you can see there's different uh, ways the error can be reported depending on the way it's set up. So within the test case, there's actually eight subtests in this one based on the, 
the settings for SR, non-fatal and poisoned and, and the masking for those. And, and at the end of it, still we're looking for the, <clears throat> the past result. Uh, and again, in this case, we have a, a trace file that comes from the, you know, the PTC or the exercise assigns a config right with the poison bit set, checks the me error message comes back, verifies that there is a correct response from the DUT, and then it goes ahead and reads the error register to verify that the, the error is reported properly by the device. The equalization test, those are a little different. So these are at the physical layer, but the logical part of the physical layer. So these are different from the link EQ electrical test that Anthony will talk about later. These are around the protocol and the, they validate the different combinations of presets and coefficients are properly handled and abide by the rules set out in the specification. So things like, is the, the request in the training sequence reflected properly by the endpoint as it goes through the equalization process uh, at eight gig and higher. So this doesn't happen at 2.5 and five gig, only eight, 16, 32. Uh, and the test really is checking that the contents of the training sequence that are respond to the requests are shown during the recovery.equalization substate. The test results in this case, we don't look at the, 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 the trace file, it's determined by the, the PTC. Uh, we do this just because when you're trying to look at training sequences, you potentially have millions and millions and millions of training sequences going through these equalization processes. Uh, so the, the the exerciser or the PTC is interpreting what's coming into it based on the request it's giving as defined in the test specification. And you can capture a trace if, if the test fails and you want to look at the, the, the what why it's failing, then that, that may be a, a case where you want to capture the trace, but that can always be done. Um, but there's many, many subtests within these, so I think within each speed grade, there's around 75 tests um, for different combinations of, of presets and, and equalization coefficients. So looking at a log file from uh, one of the preset tests, so this is 58-12, this is the 32 giga transfer per second uh, preset test. So you can see basically what the PTC is doing in this case is logging the LTSSM states and verifying that the states are correct based on the request that it's giving. So you can see it's checking for the, the reflected um, preset values are in the case of the coefficient tests uh, that it's reflecting the correct coefficients. There's rules around those coefficients to make sure that the uh, it doesn't give values that wouldn't be appropriate electrically. So uh, this is really only a logical test that's checking those, those values within the training sequences. But we have actually caught several errors in, in devices through running these tests. So it's a very important test. <clears throat> I mentioned briefly earlier that the reserve bits test, the intention of this test is to validate that reserve bits are ignored in the training sequences and the link actually gets to the L0 state. Uh, like I said, this test was added a long time ago back in PCI Express 2.0. Uh, and we found a number of devices were actually failing when uh, it sees a training sequence with some reserve bits set that it doesn't expect and then it should really just ignore that, but in some cases it didn't, and the link didn't get to the L0 state. This is, a, this is a major interoperability problem, especially when we're talking about backwards compatibility. So, um, so a PCI Express 3.0 uh, system, in theory, you could plug a PCI Express 5.0 card into it, and it should, it should work just fine. So the complete list of tests that are required uh, are in the test specification, uh, and each vendor has to do a test procedure or, or a MOI. Um, that will define any specifics for that particular piece of test equipment. Uh, tests are mandatory unless it's stated otherwise. They'll say informational next to the name of the test in the in the test specification. There are no waivers, so if, if you fail a test, we'll certainly look at the result and determine if it is a, a valid failure or not. Uh, and then the PCI SIG will make a decision on, on whether it thinks that the test should be uh, a pass or a fail. That comes up in very rare cases at workshops um, where we see a device will fail and it's some corner case that we'd never discovered before. So it, it will never fail something for doing something correctly. Always go back to the base specification. And all these uh, MOIs are all posted to the Serial Enabling Workgroup uh, document folder and you can get them from the, the PCI-SIG website. So a few new features that are in PCI Express 5.0. Um, pr principally, the, the link transaction tests are, are very similar, but with obviously the addition of 32 giga transfer per second uh, capability. So there was some 
So new detection configuration algorithms and specifics for the higher data rate to some of the tests. Uh, obviously, the training uh, training sequence uh, data rate field had to be updated, so the reserve bit test also changed. We also added the pre-coding test. Uh, obviously, I had to also start uh, link equalization at 32 gigatransfer per second, so adjusting those uh, link uh, or the equalization protocol tests to, to handle the, the new data rates as well. Quick word on lane margining. So lane margining itself, like I said, the, the, the behavior is uh, mandatory behavior for all ports that are supporting greater than 16 gigatransfer per second, including read timers. Um, and it's really a system software mechanism to obtain the margin information at receiver while the link is in the L0 state. So it is different from the equalization process that goes through in the recovery.equalization state. Um, the margin is voltage and time in either direction from the current receiver position. So basically it steps uh, up and down, left and right from the current uh, position and determines at what point the errors happen. Um, and then for Peace Express 5.0, like I mentioned, the test is a mandatory test. So you have to pass this test. Um, and the test, like I said, is is checking, did you implement the mechanism for lane margining? It's not checking what the margins actually are, but we want to know that if we ask for the margin that you're actually giving me a real number and not just some uh, number that's fixed. So, uh, and to run these, the, the lane margining test is actually defined in the phi test specs, so the electrical test specification for, um, for the compliance, it's not in the Lincoln transaction test, but it is actually run with the Lincoln transaction uh, tests. Uh, or if you're running the one that requires the device driver, it's run with the PCIe CV uh, test. And like I said, there's three flavors of it, depending on whether you have a device driver or not. And like I mentioned, it's, men it's mandatory for 5.0. With that, I'll hand it over to Anthony, who's gonna talk in more depth about electrical compliance testing. Thank you, Gordon. Can you just confirm that you can hear me? Yes, I can. All right, thank you. All right, hello everyone. So in this next section of the webinar, I'll go over a high level overview of the test for PCIe 5.0 electrical compliance testing, but I'll also go into details how to execute each one of these uh, compliance tests. So same as the protocol, a device must pass all electrical tests to go on the PCI SIG integrators list. So all these tests that are mentioned or that are listed here on the screen are required for electrical testing, except for the very bottom one where it says informative only. That is an optional test, so that is not required to go onto the uh, integrators list. So the first section I'll cover is the transmitter test. So transmitter signal quality, transmitter jitter, and transmitter preset. So if you have been to a compliance workshop, this is, these three tests are typically done in one test suite called the TXPLL test suite. And for Gen 5, this will be at 32 gigs. So for this webinar, I will use an adding card for all the compliance test examples. So for Kim transmitter testing, also known as compliance testing, is performed at the Kim connector meaning that the signal is measured at the Kim connector for the adding card using the compliance test fixtures purchased and only available through the PCI SIG website. So there are some other manufacturers that have test fixtures for PCI 5.0, but at a compliance workshop for Kim testing, only the fixtures provided by the PCI SIG are the ones used for compliance testing. And these test fixtures break out the signal from the device so that in the oscilloscope, or another piece of test equipment has access to the signals coming either from the root complex or from the endpoint. And these test fixtures are used to replicate the worst case scenario for a device under test. And for the PCIe 5.05 test spec, the nominal channel loss, including the receiver package, is uh, 36 dB. All right, so the first test that I'll go over is the transmitter signal quality test. And for this, for compliance, we want to ensure interoperability. So we're measuring the transmitter signal right at the uh, root complex. So we're measuring the signal from the Kim connector to the root complex.
This is the physical test setup for the transmitter signal quality test. This connection diagram shows the add-in card, which is the device under test connected to the CBB. Um, CBB is an acronym for Compliance Baseboard. The CBB is also used when testing an add-in card. And in this connection diagram, you can see that TX lane zero on the CBB is connected to the oscilloscope input channels one and two. And for PCIe 5.0 compliance testing, the physical channel plus the emulated channel package loss equals 26.5 dBs, which replicates the worst case scenario and adding card will experience when plugged into a real life PCIe 5.0 system. Another way to put this is that the 26.5 dB loss is emulating the worst case from the Kim connector to the root complex. So the next slide, like I mentioned earlier, so the total loss is 26.5, 26.5. And that includes the physical channel, which is the CBB plus the cable loss and the emulated channel plus the package loss. And the emulated package loss is provided by the PCIC. And this is in the form of an S parameter file. So this parameter file is embedded into the scope onto the trace. And that's what gives you your total 26.5 dB loss. So there are subtle differences between testing 4.0 devices and 5.0. So with 4.0, there is a physical channel that is used for the signal quality test. And the physical channel is on the ISI board. And for 5.0, they move to an uh, emulated loss. So you embed a S parameter file on the scope onto the signal. So this makes testing a little bit more easier. So less physical connection change and less prone to user error if it's uh, connecting to the wrong uh, physical channel on the ISI board when testing 4.0. But 5.0, since you're doing an embedding package, it's a lot easier to test. All right, transmitter jitter and the transmitter preset test. So there are two more other tests that involve using just an oscilloscope, which I just mentioned is the transmitter preset and the jitter test. The goal of the transmitter preset test is to ensure the transmitter is equalizer is using the correct pre-suit and de-emphasis range as defined in the PCIe 5.0 base spec. These two sets of tests are direct connections from the CBB output to the oscilloscope input, meaning there's no embedding required for the transmitter preset test or jitter test. I forgot to mention in the previous slide that there is an additional connection in this diagram showing the receiver lane zero on the CBB connected to the toggle input on the CBB. This connection enables the device under test to toggle through the various compliance pattern sequences, sequences for PCIe Gen 1 through Gen 5. A 100 megahertz pulse is transmitted from the toggle connection to the device under test receiver and when the receiver sees that signal, it will toggle through the various uh, compliance patterns. So these are the test results for the transmitter preset test. So what is considered a pass? A pass is considered when a device passes all 11 presets. So preset zero through preset 10. So this is the test methodology used to calculate um, the presets. So the PCIe Express 5.8 base, base specification defines how to calculate the transmitter equalization using the AC method, which was first introduced in PCIe 5.0. For a TX preset to be measured, the DUTS transmitter transmits a compliance pattern with a corresponding TX equalization coefficients. Then the equalized compliance pattern is captured by a real-time oscilloscope and the post-processing software extracts an equalized step response waveform. The DUT transmitter also transmits a compliance pattern with no TX equalization. Then the unequalized compliance pattern is captured by the real-time oscilloscope and post-processing software applies TX equalization coefficients to construct an equalized step response waveform. The preset coefficients are the best fit TX equalization coefficients 
coefficients that minimize the mean square error between the measured equalized step response waveform and the reconstructed equalized step response waveform. I'd like to mention there's a recent change in the PCIe 5.05 test pick that enables a device to use the legacy DC method using SIG test 4.052 if a given fell if a given preset fails within one dB of the pass or fail limits. So in the five test specs, there's limits for the presets zero to P10. And the limits define the pass if it's within the one dB, plus or minus. But there's a relaxed spec now. So if it's within plus or minus two dBs, you're able to use SIG test 4.052 and use the DC method to measure the presets. So that is a major change and that was implemented actually in the last PCIe workshop. That was a valid way to test the presets. And it is also moving on forward. So as I mentioned earlier, the transmitter jitter test was introduced in PCIe 5.0 and the pattern that is used is a clock pattern on the lane being tested and on all other lanes, there's traffic on all the lanes. So in all the lanes, it's the compliance pattern. So not a one zero one zero pattern, but an actual the compliance like data pattern. So the next portion I'm gonna go over is the transmitter link equalization test. And the transmitter link equalization test from now on, I'm gonna call it LEQ test. So for transmitter LEQ testing, there are two different sets of tests. But the initial TX equalization test is only performed on adding cards, whereas the transmitter LEQ response time test is performed on both adding cards and systems. So it's a little bit easier to test a system since it's one test less that you have to perform on the device. All right, so the philosophy for testing the initial preset test for an adding card is that when a real life system requests for a specific preset through the protocol layer, then the adding card is required to output the request preset from the system. The initial preset test is executed for all presets and the test ensures that the adding card produces the correct pre-shoot and the emphasis values for each preset using the AC method as I discussed earlier in the uh, previous slides. The difference between the two preset tests is that the initial preset test is checking that the adding card is able to output the correct preset through the protocol layer and the BERT is used to send this preset request, thus acting as the group complex. And the response time test is performed for both adding card as well as for system. And this test verifies the device under test is able to output each preset within a given time frame. Um, like I said, I'll be using the adding card for the following examples. So for example, the BERT will send a request through the protocol layer for an adding card to change from preset P6 to preset P7. Then the BERT will save the transmitter's uh, equalization coefficients. And for the second response time test, the BERT will now request that the adding card change from preset P7 to preset, preset P6 to preset P7 by its coefficients. So one is by preset and one is by coefficients for the response time test. So there's two different methods for testing response time tests. And this is the physical connection for testing the, the TXLEQ. Um, this is the connection diagram showing the Teledyne test setup and other test vendors will use a somewhat similar setup involving both a BERT and a real-time oscilloscope. So you can see from this connection diagram that the BERT's output is connected to the receiver lane zero on the CBB and the error detector is connected to TX lane zero on the CBB, as well as TX lane zero is connected to channel one and two on the scope, and the output of the BERT is connected to channel three and four of the BERT, or on the scope, sorry. So now let's talk about the procedure to measure the actual response time test. And I'm going to use, I'm continue using P7 and P6 as an example. So on the top right hand side, you can see this is from directly from the BERT. So in phase three, I'll say three lines up from the very bottom, phase three, you can see there's preset seven. That's when the request was made. 
And you can see when P6, when the actual change request was actually made on the DUT. So for preset seven to preset six change, when I want to change the preset six, the reported precursor, cursor, and post cursor values. So for precursor, it was five, cursor is 40, and for post, post cursor, it's zero. So as I mentioned earlier, for the response time test, there's two different ways to test for response time test. That's by preset. That's when the BERT will request that preset P7 to change to preset P6, and also by coefficient. That's when the BERT will send out those precursor, cursor, and post cursor values to the device. And the device should respond back with the proper preset. And in this instance, it should respond back to saying it's going to output preset P6. And on the bottom right hand side, the BERT, this is a the trigger setup on a BERT. And it is triggering the oscilloscope. So this trigger output from the BERT is going to the auxiliary input of the oscilloscope. So when the BERT sends the request to the oscilloscope slash the device, since the device is the signal is being split from the device to the scope, the scope knows exactly when this request was sent by the BERT. So as I mentioned, so this is the order of operation for the response time test. So on the bottom left hand side, you can see the BERT on the top right. So the preset request is sent to the adding card which is the downstream signal. And you can see that signal on the oscilloscope screen, which is the top signal, which is the yellow signal. Then once the adding card receives that request, the requested preset is then sent back to the oscilloscope. And that is the upstream signal, which is the uh, teal signal on the very bottom. And you can see the electrical change from preset six to preset seven. So now we need to determine the exact timing of the protocol layer request so we know where to start the measurements, which is the question right there. So when when does this, when you see the electrical change, when does that actually start? Uh, at Teledon LaCroix, we use our protocol analysis software to decode the downstream signal into digital data. So the oscilloscope knows when the preset request was sent by the BERT because we configured the BERT to trigger the oscilloscope when the preset request was sent. So now the scope just needs to figure out when does the device actually make the preset change. And we can see that the preset change occurs in packet 26. So what is the delta time between the BERT when it sent the request versus when the device actually made the preset change? Um, we can see that it's easy to, to figure out since the scope is triggered when the request was made. And that is the till signal on the bottom. So what we do on our oscilloscopes is we place the cursors right where the request was sent. So that is the very left cursor, the vertical left cursor, which is the white polka dotted lines going vertically versus when the request was actually made and when the preset change actually occurred on the device which is the right cursor where you can see the electrical change in the signal when it goes from small to larger. And the delta between cursor one and cursor two is 81 nanoseconds, which is a pass for the response time test. So the next test I will go over is the receiver LEQ test, also often referred to as the BER test. And this is a calibrated test setup. So for the previous two transmitter link equalization tests, those were not calibrated test setups. But for the receiver LEQ test, this is a calibrated test setup. So this is a takes quite a bit of time to set up, especially for the calibration and actually to perform the test. Um, for the adding card receiver test, this is the calibrated test setup. So like I mentioned, the first step is to calibrate the test equipment. So the receiver signal needs to be calibrated from the Kim connector to the root complex. And the signal of interest that needs to be measured is actually from the Kim connector to the endpoint, which is this arrow indicate this red arrow indicated going from the Kim connector to the, uh, to the um, endpoint. So this is the receiver test philosophy. So why, what's the point of doing this test or how do we execute this test? So we use an oscilloscope to calibrate the BERT's output. 
And the first step is to calibrate the correct voltage swing for all of the presets. And then the next step after that is to calibrate the random jitter as well as the sinusoidal jitter. Then once you calibrate the uh, presets and the jitters, the next step is to find the channel with the most lost. In this case, uh, 27.5 dBs. And you want the eye height to eye width to barely be above the targets. Then once you have that whole entire cocktail, then you change the, uh, you remove the scope and you place the dut into the test setup and you perform the BER test. And I'll go into more details of each one of these steps in the next few slides. So as I mentioned, this is the preset and amplitude and RJSJ calibration. This is a direct connection setup between the BERT and the scope. And for PCIe Gen 5, a 50 gigahertz scope is required for the uh, preset calibration. And SIG test is used to calculate the, um, the RJ and SJ values. And for the differential mode interference and common mode interference calibration, this uses both the CBB, CLB, as well as the ISI board. So the differential mode and common mode noise are calibrated with a 31.8 dB channel. And this dB chan this channel is considered from the BERT's output through the long pair on the ISI board to the Kim connector. I mean, to the RX lane zero, which then goes through the Kim connector then the signal goes out the transmitter, then through the short trace on the ISI board, then back into the input of the oscilloscope. And that is considered the 31.8 dB channel, excuse me, uh, channel. So the final step of the receiver calibration process is to get the final eye calibration to converge on the um, top on the eye width and eye height targets with all the varying parameters enabled, such as the sinusoidal jitter and different differential noise. The channel with the highest loss should be picked, but this channel still needs to meet the eye width and eye height targets. For PCI Gen 5, the eye height target is 15 millivolts. So you want to get as close as possible to 15 millivolts for the target eye height. There is a range that you could vary from, so from 13.5, the minimum, to the maximum of 16.5. But the, the goal is to get as close as possible to 15 millivolts. And the purpose of the final eye calibration is to be able to find the perfect cocktails of parameters that will produce the most stressed eye while still meeting the eye targets. And I would also like to mention that for the eye calibration process, the TX equalization is fixed to the preset that gives the optimal eye area using the SIG test post-processing tool. All right, so once the eye height and eye width is calibrated and obtained, the cables, like I mentioned earlier, the cables are removed and the dot is replaces the BERT, or not the BERT, the oscilloscope. And for testing, the BER will transmit a modified compliance pattern, and the transmitter equalization may then be optimized with the assumption that the dust receiver will also optimize its equalization. And the DUT must now negotiate into loopback by the BERT. Then what is considered a pass? A pass is when the device is ran for two minutes and five seconds or ran to four times 10 to the 12th bits and produces no more than one error within that given time frame or that many amount of bits captured by the BERT. So it's a fairly quick test to execute, but the hard part is getting the device into loopback. I'll say that's the majority of 95% of the time spent debugging if the device doesn't instantly go into loopback is what presets are needed to get the device back into loopback. All right, so the next test I'll go over is the PLL bandwidth test. And this is a fairly straightforward test. And the next test I'll go after that is the reference clock jitter test. And that's also a pretty uh, straightforward test. So these next two tests, I will not spend too much time going over. So for the PLL bandwidth, um, this is, like I said, pretty straightforward. The goal of this test is to measure the PLL performance of an adding card by measuring the negative three dB point 
uh, the DUTS uh, jitter transfer function and checking that the device under test does not have excessive peaking or bandwidth. And I forgot to mention for the PLL bandwidth test, this test is only performed on adding card, whereas the reference clock jitter test is only performed on systems. And for the PLL calibration procedure, it's a direct connection between the BERT's output and the oscilloscope input. And the objective of the calibration is for the BERT to be able to output a calibrated amount of sinusoidal jitter by sweeping various frequencies across a 100 megahertz clock. And this is measured using the oscilloscope. Then once the PLL bandwidth test setup is calibrated, next step is to perform the actual testing. So on the bottom hand, left hand side, this is the physical connection between the BERT, the adding card, the CVB, as well as the oscilloscope. And the next test I'll go over, the very last test is the reference clock jitter test. And this, like I mentioned, this test is performed only on systems. So this is a new test introduced in the PCIe 5.0 specification. It had existed in previous generations of PCIe, but at that point it was only informative. And this test is, the reference clock jitter test is also executed using a 100 megahertz reference clock. And the process is relatively simple. You capture a waveform for around two milliseconds. Then you pass that capture waveform to an external clock jitter tool. And it is measured using uh, against the 32 different reference PLL templates. And for a system to be considered pass, it must pass all 32 templates. And at this time, that is the end of uh, the part two of the webinar. And then I'll pass it over to Kevin now. Great, well, thanks so much, uh, Gordon and Anthony for um, sharing your expertise today. Um, so now we'll go ahead and um, take some time for questions from the audience. And uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, uh, please enter them into the chat. So uh, the first question here is, um, why did um, BIOS verification from Gen or PCIe 4.0 uh, discontinued? Yeah, I, I can take that one, uh, Kevin. Um, so it was really the the methodology that we were using back in the in the day for doing the BIOS testing really wasn't compatible with the way the EFI type BIOS was working in new systems. So it was decided to, there was no consistent way we could do the BIOS testing. Uh, so that was why it was discontinued after 4.0. Great, thank you. Um, next question here. Um, lane margining was not a required test for PCIe Gen 4 in 2022. Is there a requirement for Gen 5 in 2023? And also the second part, do you have an example of how a pass-fail test is determined? Yeah, so that's correct. It is, it's informative only in Gen 4 uh, for, uh, for now and will be for the future. It is mandatory for PCIe 5.0 as of the April 2022 workshop. So uh, example of a pass-fail. So basically what we do is we create a, a link with one type of electrical characteristics, then change those characteristics either by using a different preset or by physically adding an extender cable or a, some kind of mechanism to change the electrical characteristics and make sure we get a different number, either for the timing or the voltage. We're really just trying to verify that the mechanism for the margin reporting is enabled. So we can do that by checking that we get different numbers from the margin when we ask for it. If we get the same number every time, we can't determine that the mechanism is properly enabled. So that, that's how that works. Right, so the next question here um, is, do you confirm that for a Gen 5.0 device, we go through all speeds tests, 2.5, 5, 8, 16, and 32 gigatransfers per second? Yeah, it, it depends on the test case. Um, if it specifies that in the test spec to do that, then, this, then yes, that happens. Um, the equalization tests, for example, are specifically for a particular data rate. So it, it really depends on the test case. But we're specified, yes, they're run at all speeds. Uh, if it's not specified, it'll be run at the highest data rate supported by the device.
Great. Um, next question. Does all um, preset tests need to pass or any one of the presets, if it gets passed, is okay to get into the integrators list? I think they're asking what is um, kind of what needs to, um, what does a, a solution need to pass to get onto the uh, integrators test? Or yes. integrators list? So for electrical testing, for the preset tests, all presets must pass to be considered a pass. But I forgot to mention for signal quality, you can use any of the 10 presets and any given preset or a pass is considered if any given preset passes for all the lengths tested. So for, let's say a by 16 device, you have to test the far, middle and near lane. So test three lanes using one preset. So you can use preset zero through preset 10. If as long as any preset pass is considered a pass. Right. Thanks, Anthony. Um, so next question here is, um, which pattern is used for a BER test? That is the compliance pattern. It's used for the BER test. Great. And then a follow-up question on that. Um, what does BERT stand for, B-E-R-T? BERT stands for Bit Error Rate Tester. So for TXLEQ and RXLEQ, all test vendors do use an oscilloscope as well as a BERT to execute these tests. And BERT, like I mentioned, stands for Bit Error Rate Tester. Essentially, it's a pattern generator and an error detector. So the pattern generator side outputs a known good pattern to the device. The device then goes into loopback, then it spits that pattern back out to the BERT's error detector, which is the input of the BERT, and it compares the output versus the input, and it should match one to one. And for the BR test, as I mentioned earlier, only one bit is allowed to fill in two minutes and five seconds testing. Great, thank you. Um, next question, are uh, preset tests spec to be tested in order? So zero to one, one to two, or is there a random walk? I have not seen it test not in order. I guess technically you can test out in order, but all test vendors do have their solution to automate it. And the way the devices toggle through the presets, it is a sequential order. So it toggles from preset zero to preset 10. But technically, you could test preset one, then preset five, preset three, and so on. But at that point, you wouldn't be able to use any of the manufacturer's automation test tool, and you would have to test manually, which would be very, very, very time consuming. So I would not recommend testing out of order. But yes, technically, you don't have to test in order. You could test in a random order for the presets. Hey, next question here. Um, do you confirm that for a Gen 5 daughter device, we go through, oh, I think we just covered that one. Sorry about that. Okay. Second, a lot of questions coming in. Okay, um, in the test of link equalization for TX, we use power splitter plus DC blocks plus attenuator for Gen 4. Do we need attenuators for Gen 5? Can you repeat that question again, Kevin? Sure. Um, so in the test of link equalization for TX, mm -hmm. we use power splitter plus DC blocks plus attenuator for PCIe 4.0. Do we need attenuators for PCIe 5.0? Yes. The same test setup is used for Gen 4 as well as for Gen 5. There is an additional piece of equipment that is that is needed for some system testing when you're doing a tx leq since there is more loss some systems do require that a read driver is used for tx leq testing and you could use a, a read driver for tx leq testing because this is not a calibrated test so since some systems have higher loss there is a need to read drive the signal going back to the error Great. Next question. Um, in Gen 5 RX test and RX EQ test, what is the difference between the link training options, such as LO recovery versus configuration? I will pass that question off to Gordon. Yeah, so 
basically it's the different mechanisms of the LTSSM state. So conf configuration is a state within the LTSSM and recovery. So one of them, uh, it's the mechanism of going to loopback. Uh, one of them goes to L0 first, then goes enters loopback through the recovery state and the other one enters loopback through the configuration state. So it's the difference. Just different paths. Right. Um, next question: uh, Which pattern is used for BER test? That is the compliance pattern that's used for the BER test. Thank you. Um, next question: If the DUT is an AIC with multiple lanes, do I only need to test lane zero in compliance workshops? So for the, you go first, Gordon. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think this is a, a both answer. Uh, so um, for protocol compliance, uh, everything is tested on lane zero and by one link configuration. That's not the case for electrical though. So I'll let you comment, Anthony. Correct, for electrical, yeah. lane zero is tested for all tests. So for the jitter, transmitter, and signal quality tests, as well as the receiver and transmitter LEQ tests, that is lane zero. But for signal quality tests, that is tested on the far and middle and near lane for a by 16, by eight, by four device. Of course, if it's a by one device, you can only test lane zero. So for signal quality, there are multiple lanes to test, but every other test only requires you to test on a lane zero for compliance workshops. All right, next question. Um, is it better to pick or to use pick of TEE instead of power splitters? Uh, yes. Actually, no, for Gen 5, you should use power splitters instead of a pick-off T. I'm gonna say, no, you should use a pick-off T instead of a power splitter, right, for, for uh, TXLEQ. So for the signal coming out of the device, going into the Burt's error detector, that should be a 90-10 pick-off. So 90% of the energy should be going into the device and 90, 10 should be going into the oscilloscope before it splits off. So about most of the energy, energy going into the device rather than the scope. Scope has a higher, much higher sensitive range than the device. Hey, um, next question here. Uh, what are the interop platforms usually used in platforms usually used in the workshops? Do we need to carry our own? So the Platforms that are used are the ones that are registered. So at a workshop, there's adding cards will register and systems will register and switches will register. So the interrupt platforms will be the the system vendors that register for that particular workshop. Uh, typically, that's a smaller number than the number of adding cards at a workshop. Um, so if there's less than a certain number, they will be supplemented by systems provided by the PCI SIG. You do not need to carry your own interrupt system if you're an adding card vendor. Okay, great. Um, next question. Um, what are the input clock specs for ref reference clock retimers since it should also be tested as a system? I'm can you not sure question? I have, uh, yeah, if you can repeat that, Kevin. You need to repeat that? Oh, sorry. That's, yes, please. Um, okay, sorry so, that. yeah, uh, so the question is, what are the input clock specs for reference clock retimer since it should also be tested as a system? Um, not quite sure what that question's asking, but I think it might relate to the next question on the list which is how does the electrical compliance testing change if a retimer is on the system? What modes does the retimer need to be in for the transmitter TX preset and receiver test? So the challenging part about testing is a retimer. A retimer depends on what add-in card is driving the retimer, right? So you have to get a fully compliant add-in card to plug into the retimer, to test the retimer, 
But if you don't have a good known like golden duck plugged into the retimer, then of course the retimer is going to fail. So the retimer is tested the same exact way as an adding card. There's no difference. It's just you need to have provide your own device to plug into your retimer. Yeah, there are actually specific tests for retimers as well, um, although not for PISA Express 5.0 yet. So there's official retimer testing for 4.0. The 5.0 retimer program has not commenced yet, or it's in the process of being developed at least. Great. Well, I think that is all the questions we have for today. We're at the top of the hour. Um, so we wanted to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, the slides will be available to download on the PCI SIG website, and a recording will also be available for on-demand viewing um, on both Bright Talk and uh, the PCI SIG YouTube channel. Um, all the questions we didn't get to today will be answered in a future blog. Just wanted to say thank you again to our presenters, Gordon and Anthony, and to everyone who attended today. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Have a great one.